seated. Students in the back, please be seated. We are now going to start our lecture session. Continuing with the series of lectures we organize every year. Uh, there are 10 12 lectures held every year. And uh, most of them are partnered by British Council, American Center and so on. This time we are fortunate enough to have Professor Louis Gartner, University of Westminster, UK. And he will be speaking on the astrobiology and for alien life. This is, of course, a very interesting subject. And I am sure that each one of us will be thoroughly informed by Professor Lewis. Before I go on to the main uh, lecture, let's make one request to everyone. Please put your uh, mobile in silence mode. Please. And do not talk in between. We have a question and session at the back of the program. And there you can ask questions. The professor will be very pleased to answer each question. Now I request our director, Mr. V.S. Ramachandran, director of Birla Industrial Technology Museum, to formally welcome all the students and teachers assembled here. Please. Good morning, all of you. Good morning, sir. Lot of energy. Very good, very good. Okay. The topic is so good. I'm sure that you have more energy. I mean, very good. Okay, it's always exciting. Okay, I'm sure that uh, still it is a million dollar question whether an event is there or not. And I'm sure that uh, to the end of the session we will have a bit of an idea whether an uh, event is there or not, but still it is not correct. Okay, science always say until you get a proof, you cannot accept anything. Then you probably have to play with an alien, then only you will understand that, okay, alien is there. Okay, it will be fantastic. And one thing, one or two points I thought I will share immediately, I will close it off because today's uh, main talk is not close to uh, Common sense always say that uh, there should be something because the U.S. is so big. Assume that in India you are the only person who is living. It is like that actually. So it is an awful waste of space. So there should be some people who will be living uh, apart from people living on Earth. So it's always a million dollar question as I told you. I'm sure that you will get some reply. And so many activities have gone and breaks. So many people have talked about it. And so many satellites are moving around the earth to find out the alien birth. And I'll come to my point. I will not talk much. I'm here for uh, Bella Industrial and Technological Museum. I would also like to tell Professor Ruiz, this is the mother museum. This is the first science center in the country. So I am very proud to say that to you. And after this only chain of science centers started in the country. So people of Calcutta should be very proud. You showed the way for the science centers in the entire country. Okay. And uh, as the director, I am very, very happy and proud to have such a collaborative program with the British Council. I welcome Professor Louis Gartman on behalf of all of you. Welcome, Professor Louis. The students are always the backbone of any science center. Without you, we cannot survive. You are our major player. So I am very, very happy to welcome the teachers, the press and visual media, and the students. I am very happy with these few words. I conclude my welcome address. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, now I request Mr. Joydeep Bhattacharya, uh, Head Higher Education, East India British Council, to introduce the speaker and say a few words about the great talks uh, they are organizing this evening and good morning. Thank you, Mr. Sil. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amshan, for welcoming uh, Dr. Lewis. Uh, first of all, let me thank the audience. Thank you for coming on a Saturday. That means a lot to us. And, uh, but I know most of you, how many of you knows about British Council? Have you heard about British Council? 50-50. Okay. For few of you who doesn't know about British Council, I would like to tell that we were founded in 1934, and British Council is the UK's international organization for cultural relations and educational opportunities. 
we create friendly knowledge and understanding between people of the U people of UK and other countries. Using UK's cultural resources, we make a positive contribution to the countries we work with, changing lives by creating opportunities and building connections and building trust. As you know, we work, uh, we, we are there in over 100 countries and across the world, and we work in the field of education, civil society, English language, and of course, arts and culture. Uh, today, we are here as part of the Great Talks, and Great Talks is a great campaign by the government of the uh, United Kingdom, and British Council organizes a series of lecture series called Great Talks, with renowned British academics like we have today, and scientists which is aimed at motivating young Indian students to plan their career effectively by interacting with accomplished UK academics. The Great Talk platform offers students a once in lifetime opportunity to expand their horizon, meet with prominent educationists, and explore new career options. And today, we are very lucky and honored to have Dr. Lewis in Calcutta. As you all know, Professor Dutton is an author, is a presenter and a professor of science communication at the University of Westminster. He is a very well-known TED speaker and if you have checked with, uh, the social media, he has a series of lectures in YouTube already. Uh, he has graduated from Oxford University, where he was awarded a first class bachelor science degree in biology. He completed his PhD in astrobiology at U University College London. So are we ready to find more about aliens? Yes. So let us put our hands together to welcome the Indian captain. Thank you. Thank you. I think before we start, we're going to have to get the projector turned on. Yep. And can we maybe turn off some spotlights on the screen? People need, people need to see the screen um, rather than the stage. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I, I like how it just became very cinematic just then. Uh, my name is Lewis, as you just heard. I'm a professor at the University of Westminster in London. And the science that I do is in a very new field of science called astrobiology, which is all about looking for the possibility of there being life beyond the Earth. My job, after coming from a background in biology, as you heard, is helping in the hunt for aliens. Now, some of the research that I've done has been written up by the press and the media, newspapers in England, the UK, and around the world as well. So some of my work on Mars has been written up on the BBC News homepage or the Guardian newspaper. One of my favourite articles was written in the Sun newspaper about Martians hiding on the red planet. But when we're talking about astrobiology, when we're talking about the possibility of life on other planets, we're not talking about life like this. We're not talking about green, bug-eyed monsters. <laughs> we're not talking about flying saucers or UFOs. We're talking about simple, primitive, single-celled life. Life like bacteria on Earth. Life that can survive very harsh conditions. Some of the life we'll be telling you about in this talk. So when we're looking for alien life on other planets, we're looking for Martian bacteria, or bacteria on Europa, not green bug-eyed monsters. And I think this science of astrobiology has been maturing over the last 10 or 15 years because we've made huge advances in three main areas of our research. In extremophiles, some of these hardiest life forms we've discovered anywhere on Earth. And we've been exploring the planets and moons, the other worlds of our solar system, with our robots. And thirdly, 
we've now been discovering planets orbiting other suns in our galaxy, other stars in the night sky. These are the so-called extra solar planets. And I want to tell you about all three of these areas in astrobiology. This, this quest to understand the origins of life on Earth, where all of us came from, how life on our own planet got started. And then life, how life has evolved and adapted and diversified over billions of years of our planet's history. And then ultimately, how is life distributed through our galaxy? Is Earth unique? Are we the only living world in our whole galaxy? Or are plenty of wet rocks, orbiting stars, absolutely smothered with life? These are the sort of deep questions that astrobiology is trying to answer. Trying to see if we are alone, or there are other organisms and life forms out there in the night sky. So if we're looking for life on other planets, we kind of need to know what it is we're looking for in the first place. But what is life? What do we mean by this? And these are all... Can we keep quiet behind the stage, please? Sorry, it's just a bit distracting. These are all examples of life on Earth that we immediately recognize. They are coral, or elephants, or trees, or weird squiggly green things and a droplet of pond water, if you zoom in with a microscope. But obviously we're not going to be finding any Martian trees or Martian elephants. So when we're looking for life on other planets, we want to boil down all of what we know about biology on Earth to the very quintessence of what it means to be alive. How can we define life? What do we mean by it? What does it do? And I think as a scientist, we can define life as a three-part pizza pie. This is the kind of stuff we learn about at school. Life has information. It has an operating manual, a set of blueprints inside it. It has DNA that tells the life how to operate. It also has metabolism, it has biochemistry. It creates energy for itself from the environment. And thirdly, but just as importantly, life has got to have some kind of membrane, some kind of bag or a sack around itself just to stop all this other stuff from drifting away and being diluted in the whole sea. All life on Earth is based on cells. Cells with DNA and biochemistry and a membrane. But I think by defining life in this way, we overlook all of the incredible complexity of what it means to be alive, of the molecules inside our cells that work like machinery, like cogs, working with each other. And I want to show you, just for a few minutes, a, a short video that effectively shows us a day in the life of one of our cells. We're going to zoom inside one of our cells and see how it works. This is a video that's been put together by biologists at Harvard University working with computer animators. So this isn't a real microscope film, this is an animation, but this is absolutely how life works. And we're starting now on the outside of the cell, in this membrane that surrounds all of our cells, which is embedded with lots of different proteins doing different jobs. Some of them are like arms that reach up outside the cell and hold hands. The cell can stick different objects. We're now sinking inside the cell deeper and deeper, looking back up at this membrane around us. And we see a crisscross network of scaffolding proteins. These are just like the steel tubes we put up outside of a building to give them strength. We've got scaffolding proteins inside our cells to give them strength. And these scaffolding proteins have to spontaneously form together from their building blocks. And then when a pair of molecular scissors comes across and cuts that chain, it falls apart again and turns those bricks back into the cell. Now, this here is my favorite protein of them all. This is a molecular walking machine. 
It pods its way one foot in front of the other, dragging stuff around inside the cell, taking things to where they need to be to do their job. And as we zoom in now to the very core of our kind of life, the nucleus, where we store and protect our DNA, our information for life. That information is copied from DNA into a related chemical called RNA, which is slightly chemically simpler, and we think that RNA came before DNA in the origin of life on Earth. At some point in the history of life on Earth, we upgraded ourselves from being RNA-based to being DNA-based, in the way you would upgrade your phone when a better model comes along, or you upgrade your car if you want a better version. Thank you. And once the information that DNA has been acted upon, like a computer program, to create these new proteins, they're transported to where they need to be, uh, regurgitate on the outer cell membrane, and then form together as these hand-shaped proteins, these arms we met right at the beginning of the video, which shall reach up their arms, hold hands with their counterparts outside the cell to stick to different surfaces. And then using those hand-shaped proteins, and using those scaffolding proteins, and using those walking machines, this cell can then ooze and change shape, squeeze its way out of our blood vessel. That particular cell that we're looking at was a white blood cell, that protects us from infection. But a lot of what we saw in that video is true of all life on the Earth. Life is like a molecular machine. And when we're looking for life on other planets, we're looking for that kind of complexity of chemistry, of molecular behavior, or the signs that it's once worked and operated on a planet. So that's what we're looking for. That's what we mean by life. And one of the lessons we've taken from life on Earth that's given us a lot of confidence that we could find life on other places as well is a whole category of organisms on Earth called the extremophiles. These are survival superheroes living in very, very nasty, very hostile environments on our own planet, very extreme conditions. And if you start here, on this place on Earth, this is Yellowstone Park in North America. It's a very volcanically active region of the planet. And we have these puddles, these lakes of water, which are heated underneath by all that volcanic activity. So they're very, very hot. They're bubbling and steaming and boiling hot. And many of them are also very acidic, with all of those volcanic gases bubbling up through them. And just for scale, there's a path running alongside this lake here, with some people walking along it. Now, if you're unlucky enough to be walking along that path and you slip and splash into this volcanic lake, you would die. Of course you'd die. You've just fallen into a boiling hot acidic vat of volcanic steaming water. And if they didn't fish your corpse, your dead body, out of this lake quickly enough, the skin and the flesh and the muscles would be dissolved off your bones. It is that hot and that acidic. Do not go swimming in lakes like this if you ever go on holiday to Yellowstone Park. That is my first survival tip for you. But the colours of this life, the greens and the yellows and the oranges and the reds, those are the colours of life. They're the colours or thermophiles, or heat-loving organisms, and the colors of acidophiles, acid-loving organisms. There are bugs, there are bacteria, which have adapted to call this hellhole of a place their home, and they thrive under those punishing conditions. An environment that would kill you or I very, very quickly. These cells can thrive there. And if you look at the opposite extremes, not hot, places, but very cold places. Let's imagine we've traveled back from North America now, and we've gone to the very bottom of the planet, of the South Pole, of Antarctica, and we're sat in a rubber dinghy, bobbing up and down on the waves, 
as we row ourselves up the side of an iceberg and then we scrape off some of the ice and put it under a microscope just to see what we can see. And this picture on the right there is what you would see looking down your microscope in your school laboratory at some ice from an iceberg like this. A lot of what you see are big chunks of ice crystal. And this makes sense with looking at an iceberg. But because that was seawater that froze, the water that gets left behind gets saltier and saltier and saltier until eventually it doesn't freeze at all. And so wriggling their way throughout this solid iceberg are thousands of pockets and pores and channels and tunnels of very, very salty but still liquid water with briny veins. And if you turn your microscope to zoom even further into these tunnels of water inside the iceberg, you'll see them absolutely jam-packed, full of bacteria, crammed in there, head to toe, like some kind of Kolkata street <laughs> traffic jam, <laughs> on a tiny level, but those cells are alive and well and thriving in the dark depths of a solid iceberg down to about minus 20 degrees Celsius, colder than the deep freeze that you've got maybe your kitchen or at school something that we've designed to stop stuff growing in, these psychophiles, these cold-loving organisms, thrive under those cold, cold conditions. And actually, if you were to reach inside one of those briny veins and pluck out some of that life and hold it in your hand, just the heat of your body warmth would be enough to kill and literally cook those cells. They survive at sub-zero temperatures and nothing beyond that. They're incredible survival superheroes. Now, not all of these extremophiles are tiny, boring little bacteria. There are some really great examples of animal extremophiles. Animals living in incredible environments. And the one example of an animal extremophile I've got to show you, I think is also possibly the ugliest life form on the whole of the earth. So apologies if you had quite a big breakfast before coming along to this talk. Because this is the methane worm. Oh. This one's a girl, I think. You can see, she's got a mouth at the front, lots of tentacles sprouting out, head, hairy legs on both sides of her body. Now when these methane worms were discovered, 15, 20 years ago, right on the bottom of the seafloor in the Gulf of Mexico. And down on the seafloor, where it's very cold and very high pressure, you get a special kind of ice that traps methane gas into the crystal structure. It's called methane clathrate ice. And these worms were discovered swarming all over these mounds of methane ice on the seafloor. And we saw them burrowing and tunneling down into that ice and eating that ice. So as well as being, quite possibly, one of the ugliest life forms on the whole planet, this methane one, this animal that isn't all that far removed at all from you or I in the grand tree of life on Earth. This advanced, complex animal life form eats methane gas for breakfast and lunch and dinner. It eats fart gas for its meals. It's completely disgusting. <laughs> but it's a great example of just how adaptable and diverse life on just our one planet really is. And when we look at all the different range of conditions that extremophiles can survive under, very hot, very cold, very acidic, very alkaline, very salty, high radiation environments, these extremophiles tell us about the survival limits of all life on Earth. And when we compare what the extremophiles on Earth can survive to the environments we think exist on other worlds, other planets and moons in our solar system, we realize that these extremophiles could survive 
in extraterrestrial places. It's not all that crazy at all to be talking about alien life, because life like our extremophiles here could survive on these other worlds. This has given astrobiologists a lot of confidence and enthusiasm that we could find life on these other planets. And that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been looking for. We've been exploring our own solar system with our robots, sending them out to other planets and moons and doing science experiments and taking lots of measurements and trying to work out what the environments on these other planets and moons are like, whether they might be appropriate for life, and also looking for signs of life itself, so-called biosignatures, evidence that life has once been there. So let's take a tour of our own solar system to see where we may realistically find life on other planets. We'll start here, in this desert environment. You can see where the wind has blown the surface dust, these ripples and sand dunes. You can see some wispy, high-altitude clouds right at the top of the sky. But this is no place on Earth. This is the face of another world. This is Mars. This is what it would look like if you could thumb a lift over to Mars, perhaps with NASA, maybe with Elon Musk, put on your spacesuit, and then take a walk, a stroll, across the Martian landscape before breakfast. This is what our next door neighbor planet looks like. And in many respects, Mars is the most Earth-like place we know about. We know for a fact that billions of years ago, when life was getting started here on Earth, Mars was a much more Earth-like place itself. We know it had seas and lakes and rivers of liquid water gushing across its face. It would have had a much thicker atmosphere back then to shield and blanket the planet. And it would have had organic molecules, carbon-containing chemistry, the kind of molecules that make up our cells and our life would have been raining down onto the face of Mars, upon meteorites and comets, in just the same way they did onto the early Earth. So when we think about planetary habitability, whether Mars has ever provided the right kind of conditions for life to get started under, Mars seems to tick all of the right boxes. There's no reason to suppose that life didn't get started there when we were getting started here. And so we dearly want to explore Mars, find out where that life might be, try and detect it. And one of the missions I've been involved in is this robot here called the ExoMars rover. This is a mission joint between the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency. This uh, rover has now been named the Rosalind Franklin after a famous uh, female scientist who did a lot of research on the DNA structure. Now, I will admit to you, this super sophisticated, next generation, life hunting robot for Mars does look a little bit like Wally. You've seen the cartoon. And we recognize features of this, of this robot that makes sense. It has six wheel drive, which is even better than four wheel drive, but not getting stuck in the sand dunes on Mars, when you're millions of miles away and no one can give you a pull-out or tow you away. It's got camera eyes on the top of a thin, stalk-like neck. It's got solar panels to soak up the energy of sunlight and recharge its batteries. But most excitingly, for the first time ever, we are sending one of these to Mars. This is a drill. Rather than sifting around in the surface dust on Mars with a little robotic arm, we're going to be able to get two meters underground on Mars, where the surface has been protected from all the nasty conditions on the Martian surface, all the radiation. And we're going to grab a handful of Martian dirt and bring that soil back up to the surface from where it's been protected underground. We're then going to analyze and scrutinize and do a whole lot of science experiments on that Martian soil, looking for organic molecules. 
looking for the building blocks of life, and possibly even signs of life itself. This is a very, very exciting mission indeed to be working on. Now, if we look beyond Mars, out through the asteroid belt, into the outer solar system, we come across <coughs> Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is the big daddy of the solar system. It's an enormous gas giant planet. It's basically nothing more than weather, nothing more than atmosphere. This particular feature here, the great red spot on Jupiter, is like a hurricane system three times larger than the entire planet Earth. Jupiter has no surface to speak of. It certainly has no rivers and oceans and lakes. There's nowhere where life could get started or survive, as we could think about it. So when astrobiologists like myself talk about Jupiter, we don't really care about the gas giant planet itself. We care about the moons that are orbiting Jupiter. And if you look out from Jupiter in the middle, you come across Io, and then Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And just by looking at these moons, looking at the photos we've taken of these moons with the space probes we sent out there to explore them, we see something very curious about the way these moons look. Io, the innermost moon, is this angry, orangey, yellow colour. That is the colour of volcanic sulphur. Io is a violent, tortured little moon. It's constantly vomiting itself inside out in this never-ending cycle of hot, intense volcanism, volcanic eruptions. Do not go to Io for your holidays in outer space. That is my second top tip for you. But if you look to the other outer uh, Galilean moon, Callisto, you can see that Callisto is still pockmarked and scarred with all of these impact craters left over from the very earliest epoch of our solar system, when all of the rubble was left behind from building of the planets and was flying around through space and slamming down onto our moon, slamming down onto the Earth, and slamming down onto Callisto. And in all of that time since, Callisto has never changed its face. It is still scarred from the birth of the solar system. Callisto is a cold, dead world, contrasting against the hot, violent world of iron. And in between the two, we find Europa. And we think that Europa is a lovely, warm, wet world. Beneath its face, beneath a shell of hard, frozen water ice, there lays an ocean. A deep, dark, alien ocean with more liquid water in it than all of the seas and lakes and rivers and oceans of the whole of the Earth put together. It is Europa that is the water world of our solar system and not the Earth. And again, as scientists, as explorers, as astrobiologists, we would love to go out to Europa, land some kind of robotic craft on the outside of that shell of ice and then drill or melt away straight down through kilometers of ice to get into the alien ocean maybe release some kind of robotic submarine that can explore that ocean for us, looking for marine life, looking for life that might be plankton in the European Ocean. And now if you look beyond our own backyard, beyond our own planets and moons that share the same sun as we do within our own solar system, and look out into our galaxy as a whole. This is our Milky Way galaxy. This is what it would look like if you could ever go beyond it and then look back at where you've come from. This here, that is the museum in Kolkata, <laughs> India, the Earth solar system, just on the inside edge 
of this spiral arm of this glorious whirlpool of a galaxy that we live in. And in the last 20 years or so, we've now discovered over 4,000 new worlds orbiting other suns in our galaxy. When I was born, we only knew about the planets in our solar system, seven or eight. We now know of thousands upon thousands orbiting other stars. Now these are some of the first alien solar systems that we discovered. I've lined up all of their suns on the left hand of this diagram and compared them against our own solar system on the bottom. What's the first planet? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then Jupiter. Jupiter on this scale will be right out here on this scale of this diagram. And again, just by looking at the information in this scientific diagram, you'll spot something curious, something interesting, something that doesn't quite make sense at first. Because many of these first extrasolar planets that we discovered were very, very large planets. This one here is almost six times more massive than Jupiter, which is itself over 300 times bigger than the Earth. That is a big, fat planet. And many of them also orbited very, very closely to their sun. They are scorching hot Jupiter-type planets. These worlds offer no hope at all for life on them or on any of their moons. But these are just the first planets we found. These were the easy planets to discover. And over time, as we built more and more sensitive and sophisticated telescopes, and launch telescopes into space, specifically to search for new worlds, we've discovered more and more planets orbiting other suns. And one of the space missions that's been helping enormously in this hunt for alien worlds is Kepler. Now Kepler is a space telescope, like the Hubble Space Telescope, you might have heard about already. But unlike Hubble, which has been allowed to look around in the night sky, look at lots of different planets and moons and galaxies and nebula. Kepler, for its entire life, has had one job and one job only. Kepler was forced to stare at the same tiny patch of night sky. We pointed Kepler to look back along the spiral arm of our galaxy, this yellow triangle is where Kepler was looking. We deliberately pointed our planet-hunting telescope to a place in the night sky where there's lots and lots of stars all close together. And for its lifetime, for its mission, Kepler was watching about 150,000 stars simultaneously, waiting for some of those stars to blink back at it. Because if a star blinks back at you, there's a good chance it's because a planet has just passed across its face and blocked out some of that starlight. It's known as the transit method for discovering new planets. And by using telescopes like Kepler and many other telescopes, we've now discovered thousands of new ones. Some of them much larger than we are, some of them much closer to the sun than we are. But we think now we are right on the brink of discovering a very special kind of world, a second Earth, a twin of our home world, a planet that is the same size as the Earth, orbiting a sun-like star with an orbit of almost exactly one year. It's the same distance from the heat of its campfire as we are from ours. It's not too close and hot, it's not too far away and cold. It's just right. It's got just the right temperature and climate on its surface for liquid water. It's in the Goldilocks zone of its stuff. And if we understand how planets form properly, we'd expect to find not just one or two nearby Earth-like planets, but dozens and dozens of them. You'll be able to go out maybe in 10, maybe 15 years' time, with your mum and dad, or your friends, and you'll be able to point to 
a particular star in the night sky and say there is a star where we think our neighbours live. There is an Earth-like planet orbiting that sun and we think there is life on that planet. We've seen the signature of oxygen or methane in its atmosphere. That sun is where our neighbours live. And that, for me, is one of the great promises of astrobiology. It's about answering some of these profound, deep questions of our own human existence and what's our place in the galaxy around us. The one final picture I want to show you, I think is the most important photograph that any has ever been taken in human history. It's this picture here called the Hubble Deep Field. And we took it a couple of years ago when Hubble didn't really have anything else to be doing. And the mission director of this advanced, sophisticated space telescope said, all right, let's take our ultra-advanced space telescope and let's point it to a place in the night sky where we can't see anything at all. And let's just see what's there. Let's point Hubble between any of the stars or galaxies we can see and let's just see what we can find. So an entire fortnight as Hubble orbited round and round the Earth, it stared at a tiny little postage stamp of the entire night sky, collecting photons of light that have been travelling for billions of years of the universe, and it built up this picture here. Now the flecks of light in this picture aren't individual stars. These are entire galaxies in their own light. Every spot of light there is a huge assemblage of hundreds of billions of suns. And as we've been discovering in our own galaxy, probably an even greater number of worlds, of planets, orbiting those suns. And that picture there, with hundreds or thousands of different galaxies, is just like the surface of your thumb held out at arm's length. Imagine cutting and pasting that picture around the entire sky around us. Space is big. Space is really big. There are billions of galaxies out there, billions of planets, and surely somewhere out there there must be the right kind of planet with the right kind of atmosphere and the right kind of ocean adopting the right kind of sun for chemistry to become biochemistry, for the emergence of life. Maybe even life has been able to evolve from simple, boring bacteria to multicellular, intelligent animal life, like you or I. Maybe there are aliens with their own Hubble Space Telescope and another galaxy peering back at us, wondering if they are aware. But for me as an astrobiologist, the possibility of life on a galaxy far, far away isn't all that exciting. We'll never get there. We'll never be able to explore that life. We'll never be able to study it or understand it. And I'd be so much more interested if life was here, there, and everywhere. If there are plenty of wet rocks in our galaxy teeming with life. Perhaps even some of the worlds in our own solar system have life. Places like Mars or Europa. Places we've already been to with our robots. Places we'll hopefully get to very soon ourselves by sending human astronauts. And so that is what gets me out of bed in the mornings and cycling through the dangerous traffic of London into my laboratory to work in astrobiology. This is, this is to work with other people addressing questions like this. Thanks very much for, for paying such close attention. Um, we do have some time for questions right now. If any of this stuff about astrobiology and our search for alien life on other planets has been interesting to you, you can pick up a book that I wrote on this whole subject called Life in the Universe, The Beginner's Guide. And I'd also mention that tonight at the British Council I'm talking about another book that I wrote called The Knowledge, How to Rebuild a World from Scratch, which imagines there might be some kind of apocalypse. Let's imagine that The Walking Dead actually happens. How would you recover everything we take for granted in our modern lives? How would you reboot society from the ground up and recover 
as quickly back through history as you can after someone's pushed the reset button. What is the most important science and technology that we discover through history you would hope would never be forgotten again? So come along to the British Council tonight if you want to hear me talk about the knowledge and rebooting from scratch. But right now, we've got some time for any questions. If you can bring up the house lights, please. If any of you have got any questions about astrobiology, or what we mean by light, or the extremophiles, or exploring Mars, and the other planets and moons in our solar system. Yes. Please introduce yourself and then ask a question. So my name is Harpura and I am from Calcutta Public School. Possible, possible. Sir, do you believe in ancient aliens? What do you mean by ancient aliens? Sir, the aliens who came in Earth for developing us. Oh, so, as I said right at the beginning, when astrobiologists talk about life on other planets, alien life, we mean bacteria, we mean single-celled life the sort of germs you might get in your intestines. Bacterial Mars is what we're searching for. If you're talking about intelligent life, tool-using life, space-faring life, life like us, the sort of life we see in sci-fi films, there is no evidence at all that they exist, that they're out there in the galaxy, and there is certainly no evidence that they've ever arrived at the Earth or came all the way across space to build a couple of pyramids and then disappearing off again. So as a scientist, as someone who works on the basis of evidence and the data that we can find with drawing conclusions, I don't believe that there have been ancient aliens that visited the Earth. I see nothing on our planet that can't be explained by our own ingenuity and our own resourcefulness in building wonderful things in example for Egypt. Thank you. In this search for aliens, how far have we progressed in last 10 years? Uh, what I just said. That's it. <laughs> so, so 10 years is a relatively short period of time in science. These things progress over the decades. In the last 10 years, we've discovered an enormous amount about the extremophiles and life surviving in very hostile environments on Earth. In the last 10 years, we've done an enormous amount of exploration of our own solar system by using our robots and we've discovered hundreds and thousands of planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. Is that enough for you? Would you be satisfied if we've done all that? But science, science as a whole is a step-by-step, -step, slow process. Very, very rarely do you get a huge new revolution, something that completely changes the way everybody thinks. And when there are those revolutions, they go into history books for centuries. Darwin's discoveries, it's Einstein's discoveries, it's what Rosalind Franklin was doing with DNA that revolutionized our understanding of life on Earth. We've got someone with a question and the microphone. If you can wait before the microphone gets to you before answering your question. Good morning. Good morning. Actually, uh, if aliens exist in our uh, universe and uh, they have a suitable condition to sur survive, so why, why are they interested in our planet? So I think that is a very, very good question. Let's assume that there is intelligent, complex alien life somewhere else in our galaxy, in our Milky Way as we looked at here. And let's say maybe they're on the other side of our galaxy. Their sun is over here, and our sun and our solar system is down here. Why would an alien, why would an alien society travel so far across the galaxy? Hundreds and thousands of light years. Bearing in mind the way that we currently understand physics, you can never travel faster than the speed of light. And in fact, it's extremely difficult to even come close to the speed of light. So it would take us, with the physics that we understand, hundreds and hundreds of years to get from here to here. And you can't even see the difference on the scale. You can't even really see the sun on this picture of the galaxy. So if they did come to the Earth, they would have to be extremely patient. It takes a long, long while to travel between the stars. So the question is, why would they bother? What is there here on the Earth they can't find anywhere else in the galaxy? It's not water. 
They're not going to come here and try and suck up our oceans because they're thirsty. There's plenty of water in comets and throughout the galaxy. They're not going to come to mine or to get metals. There's plenty of metals on planets throughout the entire galaxy. So what might be special about the Earth? And I think the answer is that we are the thing that's special about the Earth. Our life, our biosphere, humans, and our language, and our cultures, and our music, and our arts, and our religions, and our philosophies, these are the things that I think aliens might just travel very long distances to come and find out about. If aliens come to the Earth, I don't think they'll come as invaders, or to take stuff from the Earth. I think they'll come to meet us, and chat to us, and learn from us. However, they could just pick up the telephone and give us a call. It's easier to communicate sending radio signals across the galaxy than it is to jump in a spaceship and travel yourself. So if there is alien life out there, I suspect we'll find out about it when they send us a tweet or an interstellar text message with radio rather than landing a flying saucer on the lawn of the White House. But it is a very good question. A lot of people think very hard about exactly that. Your name is Google. Uh, this is Kobe Geek Guard from Susik Sayan. Thank you. Is there more than one microphone? Do we have a second microphone? So what are you exactly lacking in our research right now? Say again with that. What are we exactly lacking in our research currently? Like, what are we lacking? Um, so again, a really, really good question. What are we lacking in our research? And it's a very good question. Often, the best questions don't have easy answers. And all of the things I've been talking about through this presentation are things that we want to do more of. We want to understand more about the biology on Earth. One of the things we, we don't really know anything about yet is how we got started in the first place. How do you go from geochemistry, the chemistry of, of the rocks or the ocean on Earth, to biochemistry, the chemistry of life? Because even simple organic compounds like amino acids or sugars or the bases that make up our DNA are nothing compared to the incredible complexity of just a single simple living cell, that stuff we saw in the video. And we don't really understand any of that process. So I think the next huge revolution in science, one of them will be us getting a much clearer idea of where we came from. How did life on Earth get started? Might those conditions exist on other planets as well? But there's also huge, hugely exciting research going on in our exploration of the solar system. The ExoMars rover I told you about is launching next year. NASA is also launching its own probe next year in 2020. NASA has just announced its next big budget, very exciting space mission will be going to the moon Titan, which orbits Saturn and has an atmosphere. Titan is a moon that has air, and they are sending a flying drone to Titan to explore it. This is a really, really exciting mission. And the next step for extrasolar planets will be not just detecting that they're there, or finding Earth-like planets, but characterizing them, working out what they're like, what their environment is like. Do they have a thick atmosphere? Do they have oceans? Do they have signs of life in the atmosphere like oxygen? So all of that will be going on over the next years and decades. Astrobiology is a very fast moving, very exciting field of science. I've spent the whole last week at ISA, Kolkata, lecturing to a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of scientists at university about astrobiology. I've just spoken to you for 45 minutes, I spoke to them for 10 or 12 hours. It's a very big, over the course of a week, People are allowed to, to, to go to the toilet every now and then. Um, it's a very big subject. There's a lot of very exciting discoveries being made. If we had a second microphone, while well, one question is being asked, another microphone can be taken to someone. Sir, is there any to introduce yourself? Then ask the question. My name is Harshwit from ABS Barakpur. Sir, is there any source of life found in the second, uh, that, uh, second moon of uh, Jupiter, that you have up in the sea of Earth? There's any source of life found on that? Moon, till now. Well, I answer this question, we get a second microphone to someone else so we don't lose time in the handover, thank you. So Jupiter's moon Europa, I talked about, and it's fair to say 
that as astrobiologists looking for life on planets, other planets, we have not yet found a single example of life on other planets. We're still looking for the thing we want to study. And what we're doing at the moment is basing our understanding on extreme files and the conditions that are suitable for life. And we realize that Mars could be habitable. Europa could be habitable. And that's why we're now focusing our exploration and our research. So we've not yet found life in the ocean in Europa, but we think there's a good chance that it might be there. So do you believe that uh, there will be a life, uh, we can found, find an alien in this space? Do you believe that? So the question, if you didn't hear it, was do I believe that alien life might be found? Bearing in mind that I have chosen my research career to be in astrobiology and looking for life on other planets, what do you think? Do you think I believe there might be a good chance that before I die, we might have found something interesting on Mars or Europa or an extrasolar planet? Of course I think there's a good chance. Otherwise I would have gone and been an accountant instead. Um, but it is a slow process, as I said. It is going to take a while to explore these, pl these places. And again, I'd reiterate, we are looking for hardy bacteria not green bug-eyed monsters. We're not talking about um, alien, green aliens on Mars playing tennis. We're talking about bacteria. Where did the second microphone go to? Thank you. Can the first microphone get somewhere now? Yeah? Hang on, we're taking the back question first. We'll, we'll alternate. Good morning, sir. I'm Sonia Tarka from KCM. And I have three questions. Actually. You can pick your best question. Yeah. The question you most want to know. Actually, my first doubt is why did ExoMars land lander crash in October 19, 2016? Why did it happen like that? Um, so I mentioned about the ExoMars rover. This is one part of uh, a double mission. We launched the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, which is like a satellite we sent to Mars to look at the atmosphere on Mars, trying to detect methane in the air on Mars that might tell us about life beneath the surface on Mars. And one part of that satellite mission a few years ago was a landing demonstrator. We wanted to test that we could land safely on Mars before we put our big expensive robot on that mission and try to land it. And it's called the Schiaparelli lander. And unfortunately, it didn't so much as land has crashed and kind of made a new crater on Mars. So something had gone wrong. We're not entirely sure exactly what happened, but we know that from the information that was being back from the instruments on board that lander as it dropped towards Mars, that it got a bit confused. Some of the sensors started confusing the computer, and when it thought it had touched down safely on the ground, in fact, it was a couple of kilometers still up and it cut away from its parachutes, which is a, and turned off its rocket motors, which is a silly thing to do when you're still kilometers up in the air. And it thought it was on the ground, and it then had a long fall to the ground. So something went wrong with the computer and sensor system that it thought it landed before it actually had. It was unfortunate. And we think we've now fixed those problems in the ExoMars program. A lot of very clever people worked a long time on solving that. We have the question down at the front, yeah? Good morning, this is Trisha from Shiksha Asin. So I have a question that you were talking about the methane norms. Right, so what do they excrete out? Very, very good question. You are good students, aren't you? So, I told you that the methane worm eats methane. In a sense, that, that was a lie. The worm itself is an animal, and it eats animal food like humans do. It has to eat organic molecules like sugars and proteins and, and starch and, and that kind of stuff that is normal food for us. An animal can't eat methane and extract the energy from metabolizing methane. But a whole group of bacteria can break down methane to release energy. So have you guys heard of an idea in biology called symbiosis? Certain organisms living very, very closely together. We have symbiotic organisms in our gut that help us digest. The methane worm have symbiotic organisms that can break down the methane that they eat and then release energy or, or nutrient molecules that the worm can 
smash the heat. And when you break down methane to release the energy, you breathe out carbon dioxide. CO2 is, is the waste product from that form of metabolism. Where's our next question on the microphone? Morris and Dan Charity from Character Public School. My question is, out of the so many, out of the enormous number of uh, planets in the solar system, why is it Earth that um, why is it Earth that life has evolved in Earth so fast? Why is it? Uh, did you get me? I do. It's a good question, and the answer is largely because Earth, of all the planets and moons in the solar system, is very habitable. It has the right kind of conditions, not only for life to get started in the first place, but then the Earth has been able to maintain an environment that has been habitable for billion after billions after billions of years. And that's given evolution the opportunity to create more complex life from bacteria to multicellular life to animals and plants and trees. And one of the main things that have helped Earth maintain an environment for life for so long are things like plate tectonics and volcanism. They've helped regulate the environment and the climate on Earth so that it's remained nice um, and supportive of life. Mars, as I said, you think was once much like Earth, but it's had an environmental collapse. It's lost its atmosphere, blown away into outer space. Its volcanoes have stopped erupting. Mars never had plate tectonics. So Mars, if it ever, ever was alive, has died as a world. It's died as a planet, whereas the Earth has been able to continue because a lot of these planetary features that our planet has that Mars does not. Where's the next microphone? Thank you. So what are your views on panspermia theory? So panspermia, if you've not heard of the idea before, is the concept that life can transfer from one planet to another. And when we're trying to work out how life got started on Earth, one explanation, one possible hypothesis, is that life got delivered to the Earth for a meteorite or a comet. We, we were inoculated. Our planet was infected with life from elsewhere. To me, that's not a satisfying answer. How did life get started on Earth? Oh, it came from elsewhere. Well, well fine. Well, how did it get started over there? Well, I don't know. That asked me. It doesn't really explain anything. And although it seems possible that panspermia, um, that life can be transferred inside a meteorite, blasted off the face of somewhere like Mars by a big asteroid impact, um, life can be transferred between neighboring planets in the same solar system, between Earth and Mars, or Mars and Earth. We can't see, the numbers just don't work out as to how comets or material can be transferred from one star system to another star system. So if life on Earth did get uh, delivered from elsewhere. It was delivered from one of our very close next door neighbors and not from another star system. And if we look at Venus and Mars and Earth, by far the best place for life is Earth itself. So if there is life on Earth, why would you suppose it didn't get started here as well? So Panspermia is not being disproved, it just doesn't seem to be a useful explanation. And there's not much evidence to support that it has happened. It's possible we've got no reason that it did happen. Where's, where's the next microphone? Sir, my name is Ovil Sridhar Das, and I am from Calcutta Public School. And I have a question, sir. On numerous YouTube videos and in the internet, we have heard that uh, many evidences of aliens have been found on Earth. Are, they, uh, are these hoax or real? Um, your question is, is very, very similar to the first question. Do you remember what answer I gave to that question? So someone else, the very first person to ask a question asked, do I think there's been evidence for ancient aliens on Earth? And I said no, we, we have no evidence that intelligent alien life has ever visited our planet. It's something that TV documentaries talk about, but scientifically, there's no evidence that would convince you that that has happened. Uh, so we discovered water in Mars. So so far, has there been any discovery of bacterial life in Mars? So no. To, to repeat an earlier answer, we have not found any life on other planets yet. We are still looking for it. And in a way, that's not surprising, because finding 
life, maybe even ancient fossilized bacterial life on Mars, is a very hard thing to do. And every time we send a space probe or a rover to Mars, we can only land on one precise spot. Imagine trying to explore the whole Earth by only standing in one place on the entire planet at a time. So looking for life on Mars using robots is very difficult. We've not found any yet, but for all the reasons I've been talking about this morning, we think it's a good bet that it could be there. And that's what we are searching for. We've only just begun our search. Good afternoon, sir. I Sanjani Samal of Hind Motor High School. My question is that we have learned that aliens have curiosity to uh, go to the uh, research on the Earth. Then is there any cause for the destruction and devastation in Earth? Say the second half of your question again. Is there any... Devastation or destruction causing by alien in the Earth? Sorry, I also didn't hear when you were both speaking at the same time. Uh, so in general, I find it hard to hear because everyone is quietly talking at the same time. So if everyone could be quieter, we can get through the questions more quickly and your question might then come up. Our question is that if the aliens come here, is there any chance of destruction and devastation? Oh, I see. It is a good question. And we talked about something similar um, a few minutes ago, that if aliens, and again we're talking about intelligent, complex life, most of the life uh, in the galaxy is going to be simple bacteria because that is the first life that got started on Earth. For billions of years, it was the only life on Earth. So intelligent any life is going to be rare in comparison. And you might ask the question, why would that intelligent life bother crossing the entire galaxy to come to this planet, not any one of a billion other planets that are out there? And specifically, why would they come here just to pick a fight? Why would you go out of your way to cross a galaxy to start a war with someone? Unless you were just being mean. And there's no reason to suppose that aliens would be just mean and start a war for the sake But you start wars because you need something. Because someone else got something that you need, whether that is coal or oil or iron. And all of the raw materials that the Earth has on plenty of other planets in the galaxy. It's hard to understand what alien might need from us to come and try and get. Does that answer your question? Then why do we go to find out aliens in the art somewhere else? Why are we looking for aliens? I mean, again, I, I've, I've kind of spoken about that for, for an hour. We, 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 find, we go to find aliens on the planets because we are scientists, because we are curious because we want to know the answer. And that is why the aliens would come to the Earth, as I said to, to the previous question. I am very familiar from Lucky Pass in Anya Cabin. I have to ask if, uh, uh, suppose we find an uh, alien life, what kind of further exploration and research are we looking upon? Once we found alien life, yes. what so resource we, we then take? Microbial life on Mars. What so kind let's, of research are we looking upon? Let's imagine that we do find bacteria on Mars. And in fact, we're lucky. We find preserved bacteria that are still intact and alive and not long, long since dead, not extinct, fossilized bacteria. The next step is, well, what do we do with that? And ideally, rather than sending rovers like ExoMars, where we've taken an entire laboratory of science experiments on Earth, shrunken them down to the size of a shoebox, to strap them on top of some wheels and some solar panels and some cameras so we can see where we're going. Rather than sending our laboratories to Mars to study life there, we want to bring the Martian life to the Earth so we can then study it with all of the laboratories, all of the equipment, all of the instruments around the entire world to understand that life as best as we can. And that sort of mission is called a Mars Sample Return Mission. We go to Mars, we find samples of interesting rocks and soil, and we bring them back to the Earth to study here. And if we can do that with rocks that have signs of life in them, we can then start to study how that life works. Is it very similar to us? And does the sort of things we saw in that video at the beginning? Does Martian life use DNA and use proteins and use lipid bilayers like we do? Or is that extraterrestrial life alien? in a really fundamental sense? Is it built 
in a profoundly different way. It doesn't use DNA for its information. It uses something else. And for me as a biologist, and for those of you who study biology and do biology experiments at school, imagine getting the opportunity to compare a completely different biological system to each other. Not just looking at different species on Earth, but looking at different kinds of life, different ways that life can operate. Where's our next microphone? A very good afternoon, sir. This is Srijita Banerjee from Hingmoto High School. My question is, some years ago, NASA sent one rover in Mars named Miss Curiosity. What type of information it is sending to us regarding search of life there? So this is Curiosity here in this picture. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of Curiosity because it is a robot on Mars taking a selfie. There's a robot that's turned its camera back on itself and you can see it's got a bit of a cheeky smile uh, on its head as it takes a photo. And Curiosity is a phenomenally capable robot. It is nuclear powered, it supports uh, lasers for doing one of its experiments. It is the size of, of, a, of, a, of a car. It is a huge, capable robot mission. And some of the exciting things that Curiosity has discovered is it's found wisps of methane blowing in the wind um, through Gale Crater where it landed. And we think that methane could be a sign of life. So this is a very exciting discovery from this rover. And it's also discovered what is effectively river mud on Mars. We landed the Curiosity rover in the Gale Crater because we could see what we thought was signs of an ancient lake. And Curiosity has found the mud from the bottom of that lake. And that lake would have been habitable. It could have supported life. And so what we would dearly like to do next is if there's any signs of, of life left behind in those clays and that the mudstone and that Curiosity or other rovers could go and explore. Our second mic is over, over here, yeah? Uh, I am Prakant, departing from the presentation with the people. Sir, how can we define habitable life? A life form uh, which is habitable for us, for any other life form that may not be uh, habitable. Like any other life forms uh, may have conditions where they can survive, but we cannot. You're absolutely right. So, as a scientist, you're always trying to base your expectations or your predictions and experiments you design based on what you already know. You base it on facts and evidence you've already got. And from exploring all of these extremer files that I showed you, we now understand quite well the survival limits of life on Earth, and therefore what is habitable to our kind of life. And that's why we think that Mars is habitable, or Europa is habitable. But you're right. Is it not plausible that life on another planet could adapt to different conditions. Maybe it could survive higher temperatures or more acidity. And although that is true, it's speculation. We don't know if that's the case or not, but we do know that life on Earth can survive these conditions. So it makes sense, I think, to look for that kind of life first and then maybe start throwing our net a bit further afield and more broadly later, when we're, when we're considering the extreme kind of environments that life could tolerate. However, though, we, we think for very good reasons, just by going to the basic physics and chemistry, life would have to be carbon-based, it would be organic, and it will almost certainly be water-based. So we look for carbon-based, organic, uh, water-based life, which we know that Mars once had lots of water. It has organic chemistry there. Europa has got lots of liquid water, so we've got organic chemistry there. Titan has got lots of organic chemistry, but not liquid water, but liquid methane. So maybe life on Titan will be based on a different biochemistry. So we do bear those sort of ideas in mind, but at first it makes sense to look for the kind of stuff that you know is possible. Because, hello, we are examples of that kind of life that, that is possible. Yeah? So I'm Lakeza Shah from Shushatin. So you said that space is huge and will take us hundreds of years. So why don't we send bacteria to space? and see how it behaves, then, then the search will be shortened. Um, so there's, there's kind of two questions in there. Um, and you're right, as I said, that traveling between different stars in the galaxy 
takes hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years. The galaxy itself is absolutely enormous. Our own solar system um, is much smaller. It, it takes only a few years to go up to Jupiter or Saturn. And actually we don't need to send bacteria to Mars to see if bacteria can survive on Mars. Because we could create little pockets of the Martian environment in laboratories on Earth. And these are the kind of experiments that I've been involved in. You have a little Mars chamber, and you suck out all the Earth air and put in Mars air, so very low pressure carbon dioxide. You make it very cold, like it is on Mars, and you turn on a Martian sunlight, which is effectively ultraviolet radiation, which is very damaging to life. And we find, in fact, lots of different kinds of bacteria can survive. They're not killed on the Martian surface, provided they're being protected from the ultraviolet rays. Perhaps under a little few grains of, of dust or sand is enough to protect you from the UV. So we can do those experiments and see that life on Earth could survive on Mars. But we, we want to know whether there is Martian life on Mars. And that's why we need to go to Mars to explore it and not just do experiments on Earth. Where has our other microphone got to? Yeah? So, so uh, I'm Ariman from DPS. My question would be pertaining to your speech. So when you were talking about the uh, uh, moons of Jupiter, you had mentioned four moons in your presentation. But uh, so the extremes were Io and Callisto, and in the center was Europe and Ganymede. So why would Ganymede not be a perfect planet for life, whereas Europa would be? It's a great question. So I have alluded already to this idea of a Goldilocks zone around a sun, around different stars. If your planet is too close to the sun, it's too hot. It's like Venus. It's boiling hot and the light cannot survive. If the planet is too far from the sun, it's freezing cold, like Mars, and it's hard for life to survive. And in between, right in the middle of the habitable zone, or the Goldilocks zone around our sun, is where the Earth orbits. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. That's the habitable zone around stars, from the energy of the sunlight, the warmth of the sunlight. You also get a similar effect orbiting the gravity, the intense gravity of a gas giant like Jupiter. It's called tidal heating. Io is very, very hot and volcanic because every time it orbits around Jupiter, it's being stretched and flexed, and it's driving, creating a lot of friction inside the moon to heat it up and drive all that volcanism. So Io is too hot because it's too close to Jupiter and gets too much tidal heating. Callisto is too far away from Jupiter. It doesn't get enough warming from tidal heating, so it's frozen solid. So it's this idea of a habitable zone for tidal heating. Europa is smack in the middle of that tidal heating habitable zone. It's frozen on the surface, but it's warmed out and thawed, and there's liquid water inside. Ganymede, also, we think it's got liquid water beneath its surface. It's habitable in that sense. However, while the ice shell on Europa could be perhaps only a few kilometers thick, maybe 10 or 20 kilometers thick, the ice shell on Ganymede will be tens and tens, 100 kilometers thick. It's very thick ice shell, and only the very bottom is thawed out. And we can't see how life could survive sealed in isolated in an ocean beneath hundreds of kilometers of ice. It's hard to understand how there could be energy flows in that environment that life needs to feed off, to be supported. So that's why we think that Europa is habitable, because it's in a tidal heating habitable zone around a gas giant planet. And similarly, if we find planets orbiting other stars, they also could have icy moons like Jupiter's that could be habitable. Probably, in the galaxy, most of the habitable worlds are like this, rather than the Earth. There's more icy moons like Europa in our solar system than there are rocky, habitable planets like the Earth. Maybe, in terms of life in the galaxy, we are the freaks. We're the odd ones that live on the surface of a rocky planet and not the ocean of an icy world. We've got time, perhaps, to say three more questions. Sir, I'm Shobin Gatta from Tatra Public School. I have a question like, uh, uh, is there any similarity, biochemical sim similarity, between the extremophiles found in Mars and that in Earth? We have not found any extreme files on Mars. 
we have not found any light on Mars. Uh, there be any sort of similarity of form? We would, so the reason we think Mars is habitable, that there might be life there, is because the extreme of Mars we found on Earth could survive the Martian environment. So we expect Martian we expect Martian extremophiles to be like Earth extremophiles, but we haven't found life on Mars yet. If we do find it, it will be like extremophiles on Earth. It will be cold tolerant, salt tolerant, radiation resistant extremophiles like on Earth. So we hope they're there, we haven't found them just yet. Though. So, good afternoon, sir. My name is Dil Namaz and I am from APS Barakpur. So, there is the Darwinian evolution theory and it is accepted globally that all life has evolved from uh, DNA and from proteins. So, what if we find an extraterrestrial life which has a separate source and has different attributes, then would we recognize it as life form or something else? Yes, yeah, so all life on Earth that we found has been DNA based, protein based, uses lipids in its membrane, and the fact that the, the fact that all life on Earth is DNA based and uses the same genetic code is by far the best evidence that all life on Earth, all the stuff I showed you right at the beginning from elephants and trees and weird squiggly green things and droplets of pond water and all the extreme of are all related to us, we're all related to each other, we're all on the same evolutionary tree with the same origin, we've all descended from the same progenitor or mother of life. But it stands to reason that extraterrestrial life could work differently. We don't know, but it's possible that you could store information using something other than DNA. You could use molecules other than proteins, your enzymes. Um, so life on other planets might be truly alien, fundamentally different from us, built using different chemistry. So when we go looking for life on Mars, we don't look for DNA molecules specifically, and in particular because DNA actually breaks down quite quickly in the environment. We don't have any DNA from the age of the dinosaurs that survived, for example, and that was 65 million years ago, and we're looking tens or hundreds of millions of years ago on Mars when it might have had life on the surface. So we don't look for DNA specifically, we look for complex chemistry of any kind. Anything that is so as complicated as a molecule that we don't think could have formed naturally, abiotically, without having been created by life, we would take as, as a biosignature, as a sign of life. We try to think out of the box as astrobiologists. Where is the next microphone? I think the microphone was already with someone at the front here. Have you got the microphone already? No. Who has got the microphone? Good yeah. afternoon, sir. I'm Ananya Sengupta from Tripani Tissues with your feet. Isn't it possible that the life that might be present in some other planets and the life we are looking for is absolutely different? So how do you think we need the right thing? Um, so your question is basically the same as the question that we just answered. Why do we, how might life on other planets be different? And we talked about it might not be DNA based, it might not use proteins, and therefore that's why astrobiologists have to think out of the box and look at alternatives to we, how we do it and therefore why we don't look for DNA specifically, but complex chemistry in general. Does that answer the question that you had wanted? It's a great question, thank you. Excuse me, why did you took up astrobiology? Fair <laughs> <laughs> ask. So I took up astrobiology because I, I, I hope it's come across when I've been talking to you guys because I find this kind of stuff really interesting. I'm really excited by this kind of science, and not just the idea of finding life on other planets, not just us being successful um, and, and finding aliens, but because I think astrobiology as a science is very, very interesting. It's very interdisciplinary, involves bits of biology, and bits of chemistry, and bits of geology, and bits of physics, and astronomy. Astrobiology mixes together lots of different kinds of science and it's a very exciting area to work within for your search, therefore. So that's why I got into astrobiology, because I thought it would be fun. Anyone that wants to go into science as a job, pick whatever you find most interesting. Pick the kind of science you think is most fun and most fascinating and then you'll enjoy your career. That's, that's my last tip for you. Let's have one final question.
question. Is the microphone already with somebody? Final question, I think that... Who has had their hand up from the very, very beginning and we've not yet been able to come round to you? Who's had their hand up since the very beginning of questions? Okay. So, like we have predicted that there was life in Mars once upon a time, but now it has died. Is there any chance the life upon Earth also may die one day? Oh no, life on Earth will die. Absolutely. Everything will be driven to extinction. Let's, let's hope it doesn't happen in the next 10, 20 years when we're around. <laughs> but life on Earth will be wiped out. And the thing that will wipe us out Ironically, is the very thing that's keeping us alive at the moment. It'll be the sun. So the sun is the source of almost all, but not all life on Earth. It powers all the ecosystems on the surface, the photosynthesis, and keeping our surface warm and liquid. But the sun, like any other star, has only got a particular has only got a particular lifespan some point in the future it'll start running out of its fuel out of hydrogen and at that point it'll start swelling up as a red giant star and will engulf mercury and venus and bake earth dry long before that final point all life on earth would have been wiped out so good luck guys that that won't happen the sun won't go to red giants about five billion years time but we'll probably be dead in about two billion years. So make the most of the time that you've got. Two billion years, that is all we have. Thank you ever so much, um, everyone, once again, for coming along and listening so attentively. And thank you for your Thank you, Professor Gershwin. On behalf of the United States of the Museum and British Council in Kolkata, I extend a very warm thank you to Dr. Dagnan. Uh, I also want to thank you to all the teachers and the students for making me this lecture. I, I thank especially uh, Mr. Vardhavari for giving us this opportunity to host this lecture. And uh, thank you all. Please, I think all the schools have registered uh, at the entrance. You will be now guided to the ground floor portico where you can redeem, redeem your coupons and take your small snacks there. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.